You thought I'd got paused then, didn't you? <laughs> Good evening. Really warm welcome uh, to you all. I was pausing to turn the microphone on so you could hear me. Uh, good to see you. Welcome online as well. Those of us, uh, there's a bit of a crowd joining us online tonight as well. Uh, so welcome. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm the minister here, uh, if we've not met. Uh, just a few things to um, uh, announce, to, to let you know about uh, at the beginning. The, the most important thing really is to say, uh, take away the, the blue sheet that you've got inside your service sheet there. Lots of things uh, for the week ahead and uh, a bit beyond that as well. But let me just um, highlight a few uh, things that are coming up. Uh, this Wednesday is uh, the, the Free Church National Day of Prayer, so we'll be joining in with that. And um, we're going to have a couple of prayer meetings during the day. Uh, they'll be on Zoom. So if you do Zoom, uh, you can join us 10 a.m. in the morning and 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I think you've got the Zoom codes on your sheets. We'd love to have you uh, come and pray with us. And then Wednesday evening, we've got small groups as well. We'll be meeting um, as usual. Uh, but we'll incorporate some of that national day of prayer, uh, time of prayer into our small groups as well. Um, in the evening. Next Sunday morning, uh, we'll be sharing uh, communion together. Uh, that's next Sunday, 11 a.m., not 6, uh, not 6 p.m. And then just to let you know as well that um, you'll be aware that last week we had to postpone our, um, our kind of cafe day with Christmas stalls. Um, we were going to have Donnie McLeod from the Faith Mission with us uh, last uh, Monday, um, but uh, you know what COVID cases are like in, in Burghead and indeed in my family. Uh, last week anyway, we're all doing fine now. So we've, we've postponed that and we've rescheduled that, I should say, um, and you'll see from your sheet there the 3rd of December, Friday the 3rd of December, and that'll be the same thing. So during the day, we'll have uh, the stalls, the bookstore, and um, uh, Tradecraft, and uh, uh, Burghead Craft. Um, uh, so come along, there'll be tea and coffee uh, and uh, browse all of that, 10 till 4. And then in the evening, Donnie's going to stick around uh, 7.30 and he'll give us uh, a, a report, an update on the work of Faith Mission um, around Scotland. So love to have you with us um, for that. And that will replace our midweek prayer meeting for that week. But that's not this week, that's, uh, that's coming up after that. Uh, finally, or uh, well, not quite finally, um, we've also got the Ladies' Christmas Craft afternoon and evening coming up, 16th of December, and um, as always, really good opportunity to bring a friend who maybe wouldn't normally be in church to come, to meet some folk from our church family, and to hear um, a, a short talk about Jesus as well, and um, uh, Jean's with us tonight, uh, Jean, thanks for being with us, uh, Jean's got tickets, I think that she can um, sell to you, um, as I said this morning, um, this is not just nice Christian entertainment for ladies, not that we're against that, but the real driving force against it is uh, to bring folks who wouldn't normally be in church. So don't just get one ticket. If you can, get a couple and uh, bring a friend along with you. And uh, Gina would be happy to help you, get you a ticket, answer any questions you have as well. So chat to her uh, at the end. Finally, um, you'll see on the table at the back, there are some of these uh, forms. Um, this is um, a survey uh, about, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but healthcare, healthcare provision, surgeries, I'm in the right area, Lizander. Um, and some of you will have seen that there's a kind of consultation. There's an online form. I know some of you have filled that in. Um, important way to engage in, in the life of our local community. This paper copy is just the paper version of that online form. And I think uh, the, the local authority are trying to get them out to people, especially those who wouldn't have the internet. So take one for yourself or take one to pass on um, if folks want to share their views about that um, very important issue. Um, and if I've got that wrong, Liz, I'm sorry. Uh, but that's all good. Fantastic. Well, we're going to sing as we begin our time together. Um, what a wonderful song. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. I wonder what your story has been this week. What's been going on for you? Well, whatever it was. Um, our story, our big story is that Jesus has saved us. We belong to him. We have assurance that we'll be with him forever singing his praises. So let's do that now. Shall we stand? Let's sing together. is 
pray and here comes Abby she's going to lead us in our prayers tonight let's pray let's pray dear father God we thank you for your presence with us and the confidence that we can have as we pray together that you hear us and are concerned for us we thank you that you made this whole world and each one of us and you remain in charge of all that goes on. Thank you that you sent your son into the world to redeem the world because of your great and steadfast love. And therefore, we thank you that however much we may care or be concerned about ourselves, those around us, or events in the world, we can know for certain that you care more and are more concerned and are able to intervene and act in the world to accomplish your purposes. Lord God, we confess that we've not trusted you as we should, given your faithful love and sovereign rule. This has made us worried or selfish or impatient or unkind or angry or lazy. When you call us to trust you, be gracious, generous and diligently obedient. Forgive us for foolishly depending on ourselves or other people or other things rather than you. Thank you that you are worthy of our trust and thank you for the promise of forgiveness for those who confess their sin and repent. Father, we pray for our village aware there has been a substantial increase in COVID cases. We thank you for the protection and of, the, of vaccination and the provision of those vaccinations and that uh, this, this wave is kind of coming uh, after we've been given that protection. But we do pray that you would protect those who are ill um, from serious or long-term effects. Uh, we particularly pray for those in our church family who've been ill or are ill now, ask for complete recoveries and, uh, and your, your, your caring help for, uh, for them, Lord. We pray for those who have lost loved ones to COVID. Lord, would you give comfort and would you um, cause people to, to, to think of you and look to you? Lord, we're very aware that what our neighbours need more than protection from COVID is rescue from sin and judgment. We thank you for the good news of Jesus that we can share with them. Please would you help us to share this good news boldly, gently, compassionately and joyfully with those around us as individuals and as a collective body together. Lord, would you use uh, our small groups, pathfinders, ladies meetings to grow us in our knowledge of you and our love for you and to equip us to do the work you've, you've given us to do in the world. Lord, would our Christmas events be able to go ahead and be useful for welcoming people into the building and giving them the opportunity to discover why Christmas is really worth celebrating? 
We depend on you to make our efforts fruitful and ask for your spirit to be at work in the minds and hearts of our neighbours, friends and loved ones and in us to draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Oh man, thank you Abby so much. And um, well, in a while, we're going to read together uh, from the scriptures and Gavin's going to come and do that for us. Um, when we get to that point, um, there are two readings you'll see and um, I need to confess my mistake that the second one is not on uh, the screens. This is a good opportunity for me to say a massive thank you to Richard who prepares the slides every week and does not make mistakes. Uh, but when I throw in extra readings... Uh, at the end. Uh, that's my fault. But we'll follow them both along um, in our Bibles. But here's a great song that's a, a, a wonderful prayer and a great preparation for coming to hear God's word read and preached. We're going to sing, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. So let's stand, shall we, as we sing. Our first reading tonight is from Psalm 125, and that can be found on page 623 of the Church Bibles. A Song of Ascents. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain. 
who for the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart, but those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be on Israel. The second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, and reading from verse 13, and that's found on page 1064 of the Church Bibles. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. The Lord will bless to us the reading from his word. Wonderful, Gavin. Thank you so much. Let's pray shall we, as we come to God's word. Father, we would ask that you would open our eyes to see what's here in your word, that you'd open our ears to be able to hear, that you'd give help to our minds to understand, and most importantly, that you would empower our will, our heart, so that we would not just hear, but also obey. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in a little series in uh, uh, for three weeks in these Psalms of Ascent. Um, I asked Davy to plan a three-week series, and uh, he did, and then he went away for the last week. Uh, he's away speaking on a conference, so uh, you are stuck with me tonight. But when we come to Psalms, if you know anything about the Bible, there are certain things that we expect uh, we expect praise, we expect expressions of trust in God, we expect imagery often about rocks and mountains and the faithfulness of God. Uh, we expect prayers and petitions asking God for help. We expect appeals to God to, to still our hearts and bring us peace. It's all the kind of stuff you typically hear in Psalms, isn't it? And this Psalm has all of that. And we're going to get into all of that in a moment. But before we get into any of that, I want us to jump right in and look carefully at the heart of the psalm, the middle of the psalm. Because right in the middle of this psalm, you get a window into the world of the writer. Now, we can't be exactly sure uh, who wrote it, but we can know one significant detail. And we've reached point one on your sheet. The current outlook. So we jump straight into verse three. Have a look. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land. Now, you can see from the heading that, that later on, after it was written, this psalm came to be used as a psalm of ascent. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that later on. But the, the implication here is that at the moment when this psalm was written, the scepter of the wicked did remain over the land allotted to the righteous. The fact that he says that it won't be like that forever tells you that it is like that right now when he's writing. What does that mean? Well, the one who holds the scepter is the one who rules, right? 
So clearly, in one way or another, at the time this psalm was written, wicked people were ruling. Most likely, a a wicked king was governing. And where was this happening? Well, verse 3 again, in the land allotted to the righteous. In other words, in the promised land, in Israel. At the time when this was written, wicked people were ruling. They were shaping the culture. They were in charge in the government. They were exerting a kind of godless influence over God's people in God's land. Now, that might mean that this psalm was written during the exile, right, when foreign powers had invaded. Although if you've been with us for the last few weeks in the mornings, we, we finished it now, but we were in a series in First Kings, and we've all learned there, haven't we, that, that sadly... These words could just as easily have been spoken about many of the kings who ruled in Israel and in Judah. Tragically, many of them, never mind foreign kings, many of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord and enacted great wickedness. Either way, we don't know who it is, but there is a godless, wicked ruler and godless, wicked influences are leading the culture in the day when this psalm was written. One Bible commentator puts it this way. Here emerges the bleak situation in which these words have been spoken. One in which evil has apparently the upper hand and the righteous were wavering. This may or may not point to foreign domination. The heathen have no monopoly on sin. In other words, God's people were pretty good at sin themselves and many of their kings. Now, why do we start there? Why is this helpful for us? Well, I reckon because in so many ways it reflects our own day. Now, we're not particularly ruled by kings and queens, although we have a queen, and we're grateful that our queen really does seem to have an active Christian faith. But by and large, those who actually govern us and make our laws are, generally speaking, opposed to God and his ways. We still live in a culture that that retains some kind of vestiges of Christianity, but we kid ourselves if we think modern Scotland or modern Britain is a Christian country. Increasingly, those who lead and govern us are passing laws which are, well, at least indifferent to, and perhaps sometimes in direct opposition to God and his word. Uh, The latest in a long line of these kinds of pieces of legislation, I was reading about this one in the last couple of weeks, uh, was the new laws currently proposed around so-called gay conversion therapy. Now, hear me clearly. There is much that passes for so-called conversion therapy that we would be rightly horrified by. Rightly so. But campaigners are pushing for a new law to to define conversion therapy so widely that it would even include prayer. So that if a minister like me were approached by a person experiencing same-sex attraction, and if I were to encourage that person to follow the Bible's teaching and remain single and celibate, and if I were to pray with that person that God would help them to do so, I would be breaking the law. Now, the government at the moment is resisting pressure to frame the law as broadly as that, but there's mounting pressure for them to do so. Please don't hear me wrong. This is not the only issue. It's certainly not the only issue we are concerned about. There are many others as well. It simply reflects the time that we are living in, in post-Christian Scotland. And we, as the people of God, need to understand, I think, the times that we live in. We are not the cultural mainstream. You all know that. And we need to be ready and prepared to stand and we need to understand that there will be costs to us in doing that. And crucially, I reckon it will be really helpful for us to learn what it means to trust God when powerful forces in the media and the government and the prevailing culture are lined up against us. And that's where this psalm can help because that's exactly the situation here. So with that in mind, here's point number two. We've seen the current outlook, but now the safest place. Trusting in God. When things are difficult, when the world seems opposed to God and maybe opposed to us, his people, what should we do? Where is the safety we can find? How do we respond to it all? 
Well, we'll come on in just a moment to the wrong way to respond, but first, here's the right way to respond. Look now how the psalmist begins, verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. Now, Mount Zion here is, is just simply the mountain upon which the city of Jerusalem stands. And hence, verse 2 echoes verse 1. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The psalmist is um, he's evoking a scene which would be, is maybe not familiar to us, but would have been very familiar in, in the minds of his first readers. Israel, it's, it's Jerusalem, I'm sorry, itself is a city on a hill. But it's also surrounded or, or hemmed in by other hills on every side. It looks something like this. Maybe a bit bigger, Ruth. Something like that. The point is this. When evil leaders seem to reign and rule all around us, when we live in a culture that is increasingly godless and wants to push us to conform to its ways, the ways of the world, when it feels dangerous to follow the Lord, we actually need to remember that the opposite is true. That in fact the only safe place to be is trusting God. And not just any God, but the Lord, verse 1. You see that there in in, in capital letters? That means it's the word Yahweh. We call that God's covenant name. The safe place to be is in a kind of binding, well not a kind of, in a binding covenant relationship with God. That's what this psalm is saying. I don't think it's any surprise is it, that, that this psalm came to be used as a song of ascent. Remember, those were the psalms that, that, that pilgrims would have sung um, as they were traveling up to Jerusalem and to the temple to worship God in all the great festivals of the Jewish year. You can picture it, can't you, as they climb up the hill into Jerusalem, as they begin to see the other mountains towering around them, surrounding the city, they would sing together as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds Jerusalem. His people. Now they, of course, were going to the temple, which symbolically at least was the place of God's presence, the safest place of all. So the point is this, when evil reigns, where there are threats and dangers and difficulties in life, where is the only safe place to be? With God. Trusting God. And when we read the pages of the Old Testament, how many times were Israel told, don't conform and be like the other nations around you. Don't adopt their so-called gods. Don't sacrifice to the pagan god of the harvest or the pagan god of fertility or the pagan god of whatever else. Don't do that. Trust God. You don't need that because he will provide and he will bless and he will help. He'll come through for you. Trust him. He won't fail you. And yet so often they failed him by failing to trust him. Again, as you read through the pages of the Old Testament, how many times are the kings of Israel warned not to make alliances with the nations around them, even if those nations look scary and threatening? God says, no, no, trust me and obey me and I'll be all you need. And yet again, so often they failed to trust God. They trusted themselves or they trusted the world around them. This psalm says, no, that's not right. The only safe place to be when life seems dangerous is with God, is trusting God, counting on God to provide. And the pilgrims who sang this psalm on their way to to, to the temple in Jerusalem were doing just that. But you know, many many hundreds of years later, Jesus also walked that same route up into Jerusalem, into the city streets, and into the courts of the same temple. And then he was challenged by the religious elite of the day, and he said these famous words that Gavin read for us. He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. 
and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. What did Jesus mean? Well, to an Old Testament, Old Covenant believer, in their mind, the place of God's presence was the temple. So the way to come near to God, in a sense, was to go to the temple. And the temple was the place of, of teaching and learning about God. That The temple was the place of sacrifice, where sins could be atoned for, where, where people could be forgiven and put right with God and, and continue in fellowship with him. But Jesus knew that all of these things in the temple were just like signposts or shadows pointing to the greater reality. And the greater reality is Jesus. So where do we go to be safe in God? We go to Jesus. Where do we go for atonement for our sin? Not to the temple. We go to Jesus, whose blood was shed, whose body was broken. Where do we go to get to know God? We go to Jesus. He's the exact representation of the Father. We don't need to visit Jerusalem. You can. But you don't need to to be near to God because Jesus is the true temple. Come to him. Two questions here. Firstly, have you done that? It's alarmingly easy, I think. Perhaps to grow up in church, to have spent many years, even your whole life, in a church or around a church, and yet never have actually come to trust in Jesus for yourself. Is that you? Do you need to do that tonight for the first time? God is ready and willing to welcome you home. But if you have done that, you need to know, we all need to know that, that trusting in God is not some one-off thing. It's not, oh yeah, I prayed a prayer 30 X odd years ago when I was whatever. Trusting in God is an ongoing process through all of life. So it's not just, did you once trust God? It's, are you still trusting God daily? Anyway, we've seen the current outlook, the wicked reign. We've seen the safest place to be, which is trusting in God. But next, the, the, the psalm takes what I thought was an unexpected but very helpful turn. So here's point three, the greatest danger, which is sin in the church. Just read from verse three again. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Here's a question. When the church is under pressure, when evil seems to reign all around us, when Christians are even persecuted or marginalized, what are we tempted to do? The psalmist says that in that situation, we will be tempted to join in with the evil. I reckon there are two reasons for that. We might be tempted, first of all, to join in with the evil of the world, just to kind of fit in, just because we're getting carried along by the ways of the world around us. Everyone's doing it, so so will I. Everybody lies at work, everybody watches porn, everybody gossips and slanders, everybody gambles, hardly anyone prioritizes church, nobody keeps Sunday special anymore, so maybe I won't either. You see, there's a great danger that, that, that we'll just be carried along with the world, that, that we might, as it were, turn our hands to evil just because... Well, everybody else is. But there's a second way, maybe a more subtle way that we might turn our hands to evil if we, the church, are under pressure. We might turn our hands to evil by standing for the Lord but adopting the world's methods to do it. I'll never forget hearing Archbishop Ben Quashie speak a few years ago. Ben Kwashi is the Anglican Bishop of Jos in Nigeria. He has faithfully preached Christ for many years, but Islamic insurgents make it one of the most dangerous places on earth to be a Christian. Church leaders are often killed 
There have been several attempts on Kwashi's life. Churches in that region are regularly attacked and burned. And when I heard Ben Kwashi speak a number of years ago, at the end of his talk, he was being interviewed, and, and the interviewer asked him, well, how can we pray you know, for you and for the other Christians in northern Nigeria? And he said, you could pray for us that we won't retaliate like for like, tit for tat, that we won't respond to violence with violence of our own, but instead in humility and grace, we will turn the other cheek and pursue the way of peace and follow the way of Christ. Of all the things he could have asked us to pray for, it always stuck with me that that was the greatest prayer request. Not for, the, not for the danger to pass or the persecution to stop. But that's not just a danger in far off places. If we as Christians are attacked, I don't know, on social media, do we just adopt the ways of the world and attack back? Are we adopting the ways of the world in, in other ways? For example, what are we trusting to do the work of Jesus and grow his church today? Do we really just think if we have good media and the right branding and we look really cool, maybe that'll do it? It's subtle, isn't it? Because none of those things are bad. Being cool has never been a problem for me, really. Um, I mean, I've never quite managed it. All these things can be good and have their place, but what are we trusting in? Are we just adopting the ways of the world? Do we just need slick PR? Will that do it? And when it comes to the Bible, what, what about that? What about God's words? Are we subtly silencing parts of it that we think might be less popular? Sort of airbrushing God's content to make it a bit more suitable and presentable in a modern world. Or are we standing on the authority of Scripture as God's word and all of it as God's word? That, says the psalm, is our greatest danger. In a world where there's evil out there and pressure on the church, the greatest danger for the church is that we will join in with the evil. Either by adopting the ways of the world and just joining in or, or standing for the Lord but doing it in a way that uses the world's methods. One commentator says it this way. The surprise is that the greatest danger to the people of God is not external attack, but sin within the church. So long as we walk in the light and are upright in heart, we are as safe as we could possibly be. But if we use our hands to do evil and turn to crooked ways, then we will be banished far from safety. The greatest danger for Christ's church is sin within. It is this we should fear, and against this, we should work and pray. It's so relevant, isn't it? I think Archbishop Ben Kwashi was basically saying the same thing. Pray for us, for how we respond. Well, finally, point four. The course of action. What do we do? This is really a summary, point four. Given that this is the world we live in, there's evil out there, there's pressure on the church, we want to trust in God. Okay, what do we do as we leave here tonight, as we go on with our lives? Well, firstly, we need to pray. Look at verse 4. The psalmist turns to pray. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. And the word good here has the sense of covenant. It's not just good in a general sense. And it doesn't mean sinless, because none of us are sinless. It's do good to those who are good by being in this covenant relationship with God. It's those who trust in God, those who follow God, those who love God. Do good to those people. That's what the psalmist prays. And we need to pray that for ourselves, don't we? And for each other, that God would keep us, that he'd bless us, that he'd help us, that we wouldn't be distracted and thrown off course and adopt the ways of the world, but that he'd help us here in Burghead and Christians across the UK and around the world in places where there really is persecution, 
to know God's help and stay the course. We pray that God would be faithful to his promises to bless his people, to make his face shine on them. So how's your prayer life? It's a simple question, but it's it's a question that brings conviction, isn't it, for all of us? How's your prayer life? How's our prayer life collectively as a church? I think I've been part of some great churches over the years. I've been really blessed by all the churches I've belonged to. But I I do think in every church I've belonged to, I think without exception, that the, the prayer meeting of the church was the most poorly attended meeting. What does that say? What does that say about Christianity in the West? So we need to pray. These next two points we've seen already, really, it's just a recap. We need to trust in Jesus because he and he alone can keep us safe. We need to stick with him and with his word and not turn to the ways of the world. That's what we mean by resist. We need to resist the temptation to be carried along by our culture around us. Or when we're opposed, we need to resist the temptation to adopt the standards of the world and retaliate just as they might. But finally, last of all, we need to be people who anticipate. People who anticipate, who look forward to the future. That's where the psalmist goes in verse 5. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be on Israel. There are the two ways to live. Where are we heading? What do we want? There are those who turn from God, who walk the broad road that leads to destruction that God will banish. Or there are those who seek peace with God through Jesus, who know his forgiveness, and who are heading not just to know peace with God now, but to an eternal peace with God in his kingdom. That's something of Psalm 125. Let's pray together, shall we? Maybe let's take a moment. We'll just be quiet and think about how God's been speaking to each of us through these few verses. Father, we thank you for the relevance of these words written so many hundreds, in fact thousands of years ago. Father, we find ourselves, we we feel ourselves to be in just the same situation in a world that's walking away from you. In a time when your church feels under pressure. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to take up the invitation of this psalm to place our trust firmly and only in Jesus and to heed the warnings of this psalm not to be carried away from you into the ways of the world. Lord, help us to seek peace with you, not walk a crooked path away from you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Well, we're going to sing this psalm uh, as we end. That's one of the great things about being part of a psalm singing church. When you preach it, you can sing it too. They in the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill. Let's stand, shall we, and sing. They in the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill. At no time can be removed, but standeth ever still. As round about Jerusalem the mountains stand away, the
just men shall not lie, lest righteous men stretch forth their hands unto iniquity. Do thou to Pray that grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would rest upon us and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Please do sit. Again, thanks for being with us. Don't forget to uh, see Jean if you want ladies' craft tickets. Uh, take away all your bits and bobs of paper. And um, see you later on in the week for uh, National Day of Prayer. And lots of other things too.